Okay. Um, well, welcome to um, the uh, latest of the uh, the um, the uh, spaces uh, technical webinars. Um, this is a series of webinars we're putting up together to uh, lead into the um, spaces study day, um, which is on the twenty. The, sorry, is on the twenty uh, third of June. Um, with the, the main title of uh, Net Zero Carbon and Building Resilience. So we started to do a series of uh, webinars beforehand to uh, run through, uh, to run through, uh, sort of give information and uh, relevant information feeding up to that main event. Um, if you uh, would like to uh, come along to the uh, study day, there will be um, sort of information coming out very soon and hopefully tickets will be uh, available from the end of next week. Right, we're just seeing how the numbers are, are going at the moment. I think there's still a few to, to come in at the moment. Is that right, Fiona? I haven't got a, haven't got a list of numbers on mine. <laughs> we, we, we've got 43 people in, so I think we can now start. Right, okay then. So as I said, um, this is one of the latest technical um, webinars from Spaces. Uh, today we have um, some colleagues from SAV Limited. We have be to, uh, Beata Blackhut, um, Head of Strategic Business Development Technical Side, and Jonathan Hunterhill, the Schools Manager, uh, sorry, the Sector Manager for Education. Um, today's webinar is the implication of net zero for school design. So the CPD will be going through the steps required to drive um, schools towards net zero, uh, which I think everybody's quite interested in at the moment. I won't go into too much detail uh, because uh, that's what the presentation's here to do. Just as a reminder, um, this is a uh, the, 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 the the webinar will be recorded, and um, from that point of view, uh, the members will be able to see this later on as well if they want to. Or other members will be able to review it later on. Um, with regard to questions, um, what we'll do on that, if you would like to put your questions into the chat bar as we go through, uh, and then the two presenters will come through and look at the questions and uh, sort of uh, see if they can answer it. There'll be an email coming out uh, if you'd like to request a CPD certificate. Um, I think that's, let's, let's make a start on that one then. So firstly, I'll hand over to Jonathan to uh, start the webinar. Cool, thanks, Steve. Uh, right, I will share my screen. We're <laughs> the author and I are sitting next to each other, so I'm just checking that um, everyone can see it. So, yeah, thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm just going to give a brief introduction to SAV for those of you who don't know us. Um, so, SAV Systems is basically a low carbon technology company. We have our roots in Denmark, so most of the products we supply to the UK are Danish, if not all of them. And we've tried to bring together complementary technology. So most of our business is um, in the residential market where we sell the Danfoss heat interface units. Um, but then we have a lot of other sort of plant room um, centric technologies. So we've been selling the low tracker CHP for a number of years. Uh, we recently partnered with Mitsubishi on heat pumps. We have the electric boilers from Varma Varoman, which is a Swedish supplier. Um, and then we have a couple of sort of complementary things to that. So the PT40 and RT40 valves, um, energy metering from Canstrup, and also energy raven from Canstrup, as well as the Airmaster um, smart mechanical ventilation, which I'll go into a bit of detail on. Um, so we'll cover some of these during this presentation, um, but all of these technologies have been brought together to achieve our mission statement, which is optimum door living environment with minimum energy wastage. So to my mind, schools provide us with a particular design challenge. We have a space which is really quite small, so say 60 meters squared for a classroom, and we have to have it warm when the children enter the classroom in the morning. When they enter, that heating has to back off incredibly quickly to avoid overheating. And at the same time, the ventilation rate has to go for whatever is suitable for an empty room, up to what is suitable for 32 occupants. So it can be a really challenging environment to design for. When it comes to net zero, then, there's three main things that we have to consider. And the first, of course, is carbon. We have to achieve low carbon at a reasonable cost and with security of supply. Um, 
when I said we have Danish roots in the 70s, if, if you're not aware, the, the Danes had an oil crisis, um, and suddenly their primary source of energy was gone. So they had to consider how they were going to deal with energy for the future very carefully. And what that, that led them to was energy independence. They don't want to rely on anyone, for example, Russia, to provide their gas. Um, but they also have a very strong focus on doing it in um, costly manner. So actually, they're not driven by carbon in Denmark. They may be leading carbon, but what they want is cheap energy. Um, and yeah, cheapest energy is green energy. And we'll sort of touch on that again um, in the course of this presentation. So one of the major elements that have been identified to move the country towards net zero is the integration of heat networks. So currently we have about 3% of the UK's heat demand being served by heat networks. But by 2050, when we should reach net zero, the government is saying we should be around about 18%. So there'll be a big shift in how we are generating and delivering our heat in buildings. When you have a heat network, um, one of the requirements for economic feasibility is anchor loads. Um, so anchor loads are typically large public buildings which have a relatively high and relatively consistent heat demand. And when looking at the feasibility, these are essential for that heat network to operate. And a school is a perfect example of an anchor load. Um, so yeah, you should see several, I imagine, of these in a heat network. And in this presentation, we will reference some um, various guides, but two of them are specifically for heat networks, the Heat Networks Code of Practice for the UK, or CP1, and the CP Design Guide on Heat Networks. You might be sitting there thinking, well, great, heat networks are fantastic, but we're not doing heat networks. Um, and that, yeah, may well be the case. But if you have a heat network, one of the key things is that you are delivered um, your heat at a certain temperature, and you have to deliver it back having achieved a certain delta T. And if you don't, in Denmark at least, you're penalized. Um, so having good heat transfer, therefore an energy efficient building, is essential. What that means for us is if you design a building that's suitable for a heat network, whether or not you connect to it, you have an energy efficient building at the end of it. Um, so yeah, your plant room might just change at some point. So it's a no regret activity as far as we're concerned. Now, what are our targets? Um, so we're referring here again to Denmark. You see this is a very common um, thread throughout our presentation. But in Danish schools, they're now aiming for an energy intensity value of 41 kilowatt hours per meter squared. As a country, they've told the, um, you know, everyone, you should be reducing your energy consumption by a further 40%. So arguably, that puts them at 25 kilowatt hours per meter squared. In reality, I expect 41 is getting pretty close to the, the realistic limit. Where we are in the UK is that recently um, the technical annex from um, 2H from the Department for Education has said we should be between 52 and 67 kilowatt hours per meter squared. That is a massive improvement on what we've had previously, um, but we think that maybe that goal post should be shifted a bit further. And um, I think it's important to bear in mind here that the Danish method of delivering energy may be different to the UK, but the method of consuming energy is not really relevant to how you're delivering it. So um, in a colder country, is it right they're achieving lower energy consumption than we are? Now on the road to net zero, there are three, four key steps. Um, so the first step is energy savings. This is the be lean step. This is the step for me that the government has completely skipped over. Um, and this is changing consumer habits, reducing your energy consumption. Um, this is making sure you're not wasting energy. So basically shrinking the energy demand of your buildings. And that could be as simple, things, as simple as making sure that your lights aren't operating and your heating when everyone's left the building, for example. Step two then is energy efficiency. And this is making sure that the systems you do have in the building are operating efficiently. That's the be clean step. Um, step three, the be green, is the decarbonizing energy sources. This is joining heat networks, sector coupling, um, looking at heat pumps, that sort of thing. And the government seems to have skipped step one and two and gone to step three. But if you do step one and two, well, you can reduce the energy demand for your buildings. So it's really essential that the be lean and the be clean steps are done 
to ensure that your B green step is minimized. And that means for, you know, for, for net zero, that means the number of renewables we need could diminish massively if we can get control of how much energy we're actually consuming. Now the fourth step is BC. Um, and this is something that we believe you need tools for. BC means that we're able to get a speedometer for how well we're performing in our building. So we know where we start, we know where we need to end, and we know how far along that journey we're on. And we'll come back to this uh, much later in the presentation. So I'm going to start with the B-Lean step um, in a bit more detail. So as I said before, the key things for um, B-Lean is reducing your energy consumption. And for UK buildings, that is going to be mostly to do with heat consumption. So limiting your heat loss is the name of the game. And that is by doing things like insulating a building better, improving air tightness, eliminating thermal bridging, and introducing heat recovery. This is a project we actually worked on at uh, Maystone Grammar School. This building was built, I think it's Victorian, so um, around the turn of the 19th century. Um, and you can see they've done this quite uh, loud, efficient, um, sorry, renovation on the building. Um, so they, they here would have minimized heat loss, particularly by using MBHR. When we look at school energy consumption, then this is a split of the targets we have. So of that 52 to 67 kilowatt hour meter squared, this is where the Department for Education believes we should be putting those kilowatts. Um, and you'll see heating here is very low at 11%. This is more like what we're achieving right now. So heating is something more like 55%. So in our mind, reducing heat loss is the name of the game. Everything else, you know, electric, sorry, electricity, for example, that's been driven down by the rest of the world, ERP regulations, that sort of thing. But heat is something that with very old building stock, we need to take extremely seriously. And what this means for our schools in terms of energy intensity is that we need to go from you know, where we are at the moment, maybe 200 kilowatts per meter squared, and 110 of that being heating, we were down to eight. So um, if you follow the, the DFE guidelines, there's a huge, huge gap um, in where we are supposed to be and where we need to get to. So we know that you know, from the building regs, we've seen massive improvements in building fabric. Um, here, these are the domestic figures because it was a bit complicated for me to find the, the non-domestic figures, but we can see that U-values have improved by 58% since the year 2000 and 32% since 2010. Um, buildings are being tested for air leakage now where they weren't before, and thermal bridging is very easily minimized and it's very often eliminated. Um, so in terms of the actual fabric of the building, huge improvement steps have been uh, taken to, to move us forward. The part that seems to need more attention, in my opinion, is the ventilation. Um, I'm sorry if I'm teaching you to, to suck eggs here, but I just want to run through sources of heat loss to do with ventilation. One thing to bear in mind when it comes to schools is that BB101 asks us for 8 litres per second per person of air. That's 922 metres cubed per hour. Um, a metre cube is you know, quite a substantial amount of air, and that contains a substantial amount of heat. And um, so if we can minimise ventilation heat loss, we should be able to minimise building heat loss. And um, so yeah, I'm just going to run through this quickly to show sources of energy consumption in ventilation. So we have extract, that's removing the pollutants from the room. We're then exhausting those pollutants, um, and that air could well contain heat, which is energy. At the same time, we're putting in air, and that has to be brought up to a temperature before it enters the room, which means that the occupants are comfortable. We have a fan power that drives that whole process. Um, and then we also have the supplementary heating, which deals with the fabric heat loss and also the, the delta T between the, the air that's been brought into the room, which may or may not be brought up to temperature, and um, the room temperature actually want to achieve. So there's a lot of places here where we could be consuming energy. So what that brings me to is MVHR. MVHR enables you to, main, um, to maintain a large proportion of that heat that is in the room. And um, so you're not losing it, minimizing your fabric loss. And I just want to compare here um, four different commonly used systems. So we have natural ventilation. I'm talking there, the simplest form of natural ventilation, which is um, opening windows. We have hybrid Z, 
which is a, a hybrid unit with a small heat exchanger. Then we have CMDHR, which is centralized MDHR, and DMDHR, which is decentralized MDHR. I've, I've kept everything to the standards of BB101, and knowing we're, we've just got an hour, I won't go into details on exactly how I calculated all of this, but this is the, the energy consumption you can expect related to natural ventilation. Um, in one classroom per year, so 5,000 kilowatt hours per year. Step up is a hybrid with a small heat exchanger. Um, yeah, you can see we dropped around one and a half kilowatt, thousand kilowatt hours for that year. Centralized MVHR with proper heat recovery brings that all the way down to a thousand. But if we can massively reduce the specific plant power by going decentralized, we can get to about 570 kilowatt hours per year for a single classroom. So if we can harness MVHR properly, there are huge energy savings to be made. Where does that bring us to then in terms of our energy intensity? Well, the hybrid, um, which is largely what's recommended, sits at 58 kilowatt hours per meter square, whereas a decentralized MVHR brings the, the consumption down to nine. Um, so bear in mind the, the DFE's energy intensity target was eight. We're getting very close there. One thing I want to highlight here, um, because I think this is something that's not well understood in the industry, is um, this is sort of genuine energy consumption. This here is a is part of a report for a school that we worked on um, where they've compared hybrid or mixed boxes with MVHR, and you can see there's 64% difference in that instance in energy consumption for that building. What that translates to is a massive reduction in the capital plant required to heat that building. So, okay, I don't know how many heat pumps they started with and how many they ended up with, but what we know is that by reducing the um, the energy demand for that building substantially, a lot of that heating plant will not be needed anymore. Um, and once we get later into the presentation, the will be focuses on different ways of how you deliver that heat. Um, we have some great ideas of how you can further reduce the cost and the quantity of capital plant you need to deliver heat to these buildings. We move on now to the be clean, the energy efficiency, and I just have a little bit to say here. Um, so I pulled here some of the key features of successful heat networks. This is from the Sibsi Heat Networks Design Guide, and there are more of these in there, but a lot of them um, apply much more to residential properties. These apply pretty much universally. So um, these are, yeah, so some of the key features for successful low carbon energy efficient heat networks. So the first is variable speed pumps and fans. The second is flow temperature as low as possible, maximum delta T, um, and the recommended 60-30. Third is prioritizing low common heat sources, and the fourth is using thermal storage to store heat and to manage short-term peak demands. I'm just going to briefly tackle this first one before I hand over to Beata, and this is the variable speed pumps and fans. The graph on the right is the pump affinity law, and if you're not familiar with this, essentially what it says is that if you can reduce your speed and your pump to half, you bring the pressure required to deliver that the, the same amount of uh, water down to a quarter, and your energy consumption comes down to an eighth. So the innovative step that was done in the last 20, 30 years was to um, start using variable speed pumps to deliver your water. So, okay, you may not run at 50% for the lifetime of the, the pump, but certainly when you do, you take advantage of the energy savings you achieve there. To my mind, um, if we, yeah, the, the variable speed fan methodology hasn't been so well applied, um, but the fan is a pump, it just moves uh, air instead of water. If we assume that for net zero, uh, we will have to have heat recovery, which um, seems to be universally accepted in, in Europe, um, we have two main choices, and these are centralized and decentralized systems. Um, centralized have been popular in Northern Europe for a long time. But they have, a, in my mind, a couple of inherent issues. The first is that you need a lot of specific fan power to deliver air. So um, you know, sending air down from your rooftop air handling unit all the way to your classrooms requires a lot of fan power, um, which is not present in, in decentralized systems. And secondly, it's very hard to do variable volume or demand controlled ventilation because if your load changes in one room, the, the reduced, uh, sorry, the, the change in pressure that that would 
cause would affect all your other ones. So generally, these are done at constant volume. Demand control, though, is a fantastic method of controlling your energy. So um, this graph is a data log that I took from Queen's Ferry High School. It's a um, it's the flagship low carbon school for Edinburgh. Um, and you can see here very clearly that in yellow, the CO2 levels change throughout the day, and in green, the fan speed has changed to match it, which means that they have very good indoor air quality in that classroom. But the, the bit I want to point out here really is that if you had a constant volume system uh, without demand control, everything above that line would be energy consumption that wasn't needed. So there's a lot of energy here to be saved by using demand control ventilation. Um, we're not too product focused in this presentation, but I just want to mention our Air Master units. Um, this was one that we had Passive House certified in about April last year. Uh, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. <laughs> um, the thing I wanted to highlight was the, the specific fan power. So um, let's call it 0.9 watts per litre per second. Here I'm comparing two um, heat recovery systems, so at, at constant flow rates. So we have our centralized system with a specific fan power of 2 and a decentralized system with a specific fan power of 0.9. And immediately you can see for the same quantity of air, a huge reduction in how much energy you need. If we then apply that demand control profile to the same classroom, you can see that the amount of energy required diminishes even further. And it's about 78% difference between the centralized constant volume and the decentralized and demand control. And um, so if we can harness the, the demand control element of ventilation, there are even further savings to be made. This is my last slide. Um, there's been a lot of focus on embodied carbon as well. When we look at centralized and decentralized ventilation, there's a yeah, lot of carbon in all the steel work that you need for a centralized system to deliver air, which is not present in a decentralized system. So um, again, a lot of embodied carbon to be saved. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Beata. So um, thank you for listening. Thank you, Jonathan. Just a moment, I share my screen and we will continue with this presentation. So further discussion on how we achieved an efficient system and focusing, as Jonathan mentioned already, on heating, but as well on domestic hot water. So building services, delivering hydronics in the most energy efficient way. If you involved in any design or, or delivery of the new project, you probably might be familiar that the, the temperatures, the design temperatures, they have been changing over the years. I would say 7040 it was quite established standard for last five years when 70 meant a flow temperature delivered from plant room to supply heating hot water and 40 being returned. As I would say from publication of CP1 uh, updated version code of practice for heat networks last year, then really 6030 is being discussed. So we're lowering the, the temperatures uh, with the aim to achieve more efficient design and operation of the building. So where we are now on those on those temperatures and with existing schools, as we've been supplying equipment to the plant rooms for, for many years, we have uh, systems that we monitor. So we, we've been supplying CHP systems for about 15 years, last 15 years, and we monitor that equipment. So we can see what the return temperature is coming back to the plant room with that system being installed. As you can see on the list here is several schools uh, all over the country that uh, there is a variation in temperatures, but average one is 65 degrees. So obviously quite high temperatures, some of them being even above 70 degrees. So that's return coming back to plant room. Those projects were designed deliver over years. So maybe they were designed 80, 60, maybe 70, 40, but whichever was the design intent, we can see clearly is not being achieved. So that's what is called performance gap that Unfortunately, you know, the buildings are not delivering exactly what maybe was on the intent of the design. That's why at the end we will start talking, I think we need more tools and closer monitoring of operation of the buildings because it's important, you know, what decisions are made on the design and sizing, then obviously good installation and good commissioning to give the chance for the equipment selected and all the systems to operate correctly. But as well, a small change, small tweak by the maintenance person on a set point for boilers, for example, so far, 
or opening some valve somewhere on the on the system can really jeopardize the return temperatures and it will obviously make the system less efficient which what is really important for us it means higher co2 emissions and much higher energy bill so that's definitely a lot to be done you know from where we you know where we heading to have 60 30 systems why is it important now to focus as well that we're looking to lower temperatures but as well to keep delta t which is the difference between flow and return temperature as big as possible there is a tendency nowadays that there is a temp maybe from some designers to look on a smaller delta t for the whole system like 45 40 like example on the slide here because that's quite often the temperatures that uh, heat pumps operate with lots of heat pumps especially on a smaller end of range they operate with constant delta t and quite often it is five maybe seven degrees and there might be a temptation to design the whole building with the same temperature set and the small delta t that's not the right approach because this will result in a very high flow rate a very simple example of calculation here for a small heat load of three kilowatts but you can see that with delta t of five degrees we have flow rate of 0.14 kilograms per second if we have the same amount of heat to be delivered but delta t of the system is 30 degrees that result in a lot smaller flow rate and that's why it's important the building itself needs to be designed with low temperatures but as big delta t as possible and then as Jonathan mentioned already at the beginning either we then go to the plant room and put locally equipment or do we connect it to heat network it will be equally you know satisfying the needs for efficient operation of local plant room or central plant room somewhere on district heating so it's very important that the delta T of the building on the heating system, on the domestic hot water system, as, as big as possible. Because that, that flow rate results then in a, in a pipe sizing and pump sizing and distribution losses. When it comes to choice of temperatures, uh, I mentioned that we now look at the flow temperature to be 60 degrees. And we, I would say not that long ago, about 10 years ago, I would say 80 was a standard. So we're lowering it, but why we end it now, now with 60 as a, as a starting point, I would say. There might be projects that can be lowered to 55. Maybe some of them we need 65 for uh, specific reasons. I would say as a rule of time, starting point 60 as a supply temperature. Because there's two things. We're lowering the temperature because we want to reduce the distribution losses from pine pork, as you can see the first point. And as well, we want to be able to integrate different heat sources, like, for example, heat pumps. For heat pumps, it is very important that the whole systems are in the lower temperature uh, operation range. Apart from typical sources, like we used to have gas boilers and gas boiler and CHP, then now we're discussing a lot heat pumps. As well, there are other heat sources which will be serving heat networks. It could be a waste heat from industry, could be waste heat from a tube, for example, from underground. It could be a waste heat from cooling uh, server rooms. So a lot of various waste heat sources which we are planning to use in the future and definitely they will be at the lower temperature range. That's the reason why we're lowering it from traditional 80 or 70 degrees design. However, on the other hand, we need to keep in mind that we need to satisfy the requirements for the users of the building. And as on the heating side, delivering of heating demands, we have quite a, a wide range or scope of temperatures we can operate with and select different systems. When it comes to domestic hot water, it's very important, you know, safety requirements there. And usually delivery of 60 degrees is what's limiting us. And we cannot really go lower with those temperatures. It doesn't mean that we have 60 that is, you know, it's, it's delivered to, to the tub, so people need to use. It means I will touch a bit more on the detail of how we deliver hot water. Obviously, that needs the system which is delivering and look as where do we store domestic hot water or not. Steve's asked a question here. Um, <clears throat> well, made a point, I think. Uh, yeah, question. Um, with the new building regs, systems to be designed with a max flow of 55 degrees C, do we stick with the 30 degree delta T? Uh, say maximum 55 degrees yes. yeah so that's uh yes i would say if possible so if you look at radiators that is possible to look into it it might be that on the heating system maybe it will be 25 not 30. so basically i would say the rule is to have delta t it was example here 30 degrees but delta t should be as big as possible 
Then is the question of exactly selecting, which I touch later, what kind of system we delivering heating or hot water. That 55 is specific for heating and specifically for radiators. So having 55. So what that means that it could be possible on sometimes have 55 delivered from plant room and then directly to radiators. And then if you have a instantaneous hot water generation, potentially you can lower that flow temperature as well. So 30 is not like a very strict number, but it should be as big as possible. Definitely close to 30, so 25, 30, uh, not 5 or 10 degrees. Yeah, hopefully that. Yes, you gave me a um, thumbs up. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. The challenge to interact if I have just a presentation on my screen. Uh, moving on, one other, you know, another important point, which is. Uh, consequence of having system with small or big delta T. So if we have a thermal storage included in the plant room, and I would say going forward, it, it will be even more important than it was so far, that capacity of that storage depends on the delta T across the system. Basically, it's the difference what is the cold water at the bottom of storage and hot at the top of the storage. And you can see here, if I have 1,000 liters of vessel included in a, in a plant room, but delta T is only five degrees, it's only six kilowatts of heat I can store there, or kilowatt hours. If I have delta T of 30 degrees, you can see it's about six times more a heat capacity. So obviously we can port more vessels there, but that's always a cost and space requirement. But the ones that we put, we can maximize the capacity by having a big, bigger delta T across them. Why I'm saying that going forward, I believe that will be even more important role is what's, what we're showing here on the right hand side of the slide. It's basically that what you see here is the half hourly pricing for electricity. This is happening already now. That's actually a screenshot from our, one of our colleagues who is on a tariff like this. You can see that electricity, it goes from even below 1p here at midnight and going to something like 16p in the afternoon. Admittedly, that was a few months ago. I think we can multiply two or three times probably now. But you can see that what's important is a huge variation in prices. As we have more renewables on the grid, this is going to be the future. This is going to happen. Why? Because renewables, wind turbines and PV, but in the UK, obviously, the wind turbines generation is the most important factor. They are weather dependent is not typical gas or coal power station as we used to have in the past, that basically we were modulating them, switching on and off as in response to demand. Now, wind turbines will generate a lot because there is a windy weather. On some other times, we might need a lot of electricity, but if there is no wind, then gas power stations have to ramp up, and that's where electricity prices are going up. So first of all, electricity will be more expensive, but this is, actually quite handy, quite nice, that price and CO2 content go hand in hand. So basically, when we have low price of electricity, it's usually low carbon. High price of electricity, which means high carbon content from that grid electricity. So what storage help us? Storage, and if we have any equipment consuming electricity in the plant room, which heat pumps are the most obvious choice, which I think everyone is embracing now, we can have electric boilers as well we can plan the operation. So if I have sufficient storage, I can run the heat pump at night here when it's very cheap electricity, fill the storage and utilize that heat later on when, for example, we open the school, but electricity is a lot more expensive. So optimizing capacity of storage and then planning a schedule of operation, I think that's something to come. That's happening already in Denmark and I think for UK, that's, that's a matter only of time. As you might be aware that anyone who got electric car already is, you know, taking the advantage of, of tariffs at different time of day. And I think for heating system, for operating plant rooms, that's something which is, uh, which is coming probably very quickly, especially with the latest increase in prices of electricity. So summarizing that, that the, the hydronic design, really we're looking at lowering flow and return temperature, keeping delta T as big as possible. Why is that? You know, that's obviously the details of the calculation, but if we have big delta T, we have a small flow rate. And with the smaller flow rate, we will have smaller pipes, less energy for pumping, less distribution losses. 
And that obviously the, the other point is that we need to focus on very, very low return temperature at all times. That's not something that we can plan in a plant room. That is subject of how we design and operate secondary systems, so heating and hot water system. And that allows us, this, again, reducing distribution losses and integration of different low carbon technologies in the plant room. So now a little bit of detail on, on uh, how we can deliver hot water and heating in a school. When it comes to domestic hot water, I would say over the last yeah, 15 years, and it's schools design I've seen that pretty much was this kind of design as we see on the left hand side. So central generation of hot water and clarifier. Clarifier vessel with the coil for a central generation of domestic hot water. Because we store here domestic potable water, it means that we need to deal with the Legionella risk and we have to have that water pasteurized above 60 or at least 60 degrees. It means the supply from plant room usually is required to be 70 degrees. And because as well that depends, you know, what is the, the content of that uh, vessel, how, how hot it is in a given moment, but it can be up to 55, 60 degrees. It means we will have high return temperature, even as high as 65. And as well, the coil is not the most efficient way of exchanging heat. So I would say this way of designing hot water system is not really suitable going forward because it really pushes the design for much higher temperatures on the flows on the supply side, and we have a problem with the higher return. So that's not really suitable for implication or installation of the heat pump in such system. There is some improvement that uh, that we can you know look into central generation of hot water that will still have that storage for potable water, but instead of coil having a plate heat exchanger that delivers some you know better efficiency of exchange and as well by connecting it as a cold water supply at 10 degrees supplying here we will have lower return temperatures at some point as low as 20 degrees, but obviously as we start filling that storage, it's still the same issues with Legionella that needs to be up to 60 degrees. That, that water at some point will be mixing with our cold supply. It means higher temperature on this side of plate, higher return, so it could be going 30, 40. So definitely improvement from clarifier, but still we, we, can, we cannot have that low return at all times. For that reason, what we are, you know, looking, you know, thinking about it and looking what could be another way to deliver hot water in a school is inspiration from residential sector. So what you see here is a very small heat interface unit just with one plate for hot water. So basically it's a system for instantaneous hot water generation. There is no storage, but as well what's important, this needs to be close to the point of use. This is not in the plant room, this is close at the point of use. So basically what we're saying that instead of having system traditionally as it was so far that we have a hot water from clarifier coming to all the tubs and kitchen sinks and so on, showers, and then return going back to plant room. Instead of this, this will be flow and return and then locally HI use. So for example, it could be HI use on each floor serving a cluster of the boys and girls toilets, yeah? So several probably throughout the school, but that obviously allows us to lower the temperature. So as this is instantaneous generation, there is a lot of CPC documentation saying that we can lower the, the, the design temperature for hot water down to 50 degrees. We don't need to keep it at 60. It's a, obviously a very small amount of potable water on the just in the pipes. Again, being careful how this is designed and not to have too, too much of water content there. But that is then 50 degrees means 60 supply is sufficient. And most important feature that having that plate heat exchanger will allow us to have low return around 20 degrees back to plant room at all times. And that's the, the biggest benefit of switching from central generation of hot water to decentralized system. When we look on the heating, delivering heating, that's this challenge Jonathan mentioned at the beginning of presentation that we have, you know, we have a room full of, of kids, 30, 32 kids, which obviously needs to be up to temperature as they come to, to school. But then really very quickly, we want to back off with heating systems because otherwise it will lead to overheating. So when we refer to BB101, which is a document focusing mostly on the ventilation requirements, 
but there is a mention a little bit about heating system. We can find that uh, paragraph there, as you can see, that they basically say that underfloor heating should not be used where the heating profile is changing quickly. And that is a case when we have uh, when we have a school environment. So that's not really recommended, and that's because of the slow response time. Because even if we close the valves very quickly, which are controlling the, the flow to underfloor, we still is a very long time before all the heat is being dissipated. Basically, the whole floor is one big radiator. So I would say under floor, although it can operate with low return temperatures, it's probably not the best choice for a design of the, an education or building. So we rather than looking into having radiators to deliver the, the heating loads, and then it's important to look on the details of what kind of valves are controlling those radiators. Thermostatic uh, radiator valves, I'm not sure if you're aware, but they can have a head with the gas, liquid, or wax head, and you can see their response time. It really varies a lot, and because we need a quick response time in a school, we really need the one with the gas head. It shows here on that simple, simple animation here that firstly the valve was open, now we have solar radiator kits in the classroom, we want to close that valve. And you can see the first one, RA2000, that's the gas head. You can see that it's closing a lot quicker than basically takes twice as long liquid head and a lot longer wax head. So paying attention to a detail what kind of radiator valves are installed there for that quick response which we need in the school. Another very important point is then how radiators are being balanced in schools. That's a subject which we, we've seen over years that is really overlooked, is missed. We can see it even in the residential sector when we're talking about apartment, which got two or three bedrooms, so basically, I don't know, maybe five, six radiators per one apartment, so small system. And that's usually not being balanced, properly set up on commissioning. And when we come to schools, obviously, challenge is much bigger because you have several classrooms, several floors. So the whole system really needs a good balancing so we can control flow to all, each radiator very well. How we can balance radiators? Very important thing is what kind of valves are being installed. So TRVs, I would say, you know, the, the thermostatic radiator valves, that's a standard that's installed on every radiator. But instead of having that traditional simple TRV, you can install what's called pressure independent TRV. So got all these functions, as you know from TRV, there will be a head here at the top, but you can see at the bottom here is something called DPCV. Um, I have a challenge today, I don't know how technical for the audience is, so I don't want to bore you with too many details, but this is a, a valve which, which controls the pressure on the system, and if we have a good control of the pressure, then we have a good valve authority, so basically very good control of the flow. We deliver to radiator only what is required, and when the room comfort is achieved, that valve will be closed, not overpowered by the pump, and we have a we have back off, you know, we switch off, turn turn down the, the heating system. You can see here from the design guide that actually proper high balancing of the radiators can provide heat savings in a range of nine to fifteen percent. That was through the different research on different countries in Europe. So even if the, you know that's one step that is a good design and installation of the system, but then the proper commissioning can deliver huge savings. What this pressure independent radiator valve offers us, that is basically a simply presetting, there's a dial on the top, and then it's self-operating, uh, I would say, self-controlling. If we have standard radiator valves, what you see here on that left-hand side is that if some of the radiators will be closing, because it's maybe on the sunny side of the school, the TRVs will be closing, we will be experiencing overflow in other radiators. Basically, if we close some valves, that will be that same pressure and that flow wants to go somewhere, it will overpower the other valves, and we have water rushing through radiators, not exchanging heat, and high return going back to plant room. If we have the pressure independent TRVs, you can see that, that equally maintaining the flow rate uh, on all radiators at all times, and that results in a low return temperatures at all times. The press setting you can see here is a very simple commissioning step, is the schedule of radiators, knowing what is required flow rate, and each setting corresponds to the given flow rate, as you see on the dial here in the liters per hour. 
And then basically what it means if we if we preset that valve to one, two, or three requirement, whatever that is for a given size of radiator, it creates the ceiling. It means that flow rate on that radiator will never go above that preset value. We will not experience overflow resulting in a high temperatures. But obviously, if the head of this valve, which is sitting on top here on that spindle, it will be as, as any other TRV, it will be closing, it will be pushing down the spindle, and that flow rate will be reducing and going down to zero. But we will basically avoid everything here at the top part of that graph. So that's something to keep in mind, you know, when selecting the, the heating system and balancing, so the commissioning step of that uh, of that heating system. A few points on energy center or how we deliver them from this this heating and hot water. One thing could be the connection to district heating if there is one in the area. So basically, it will be substation and then hot water in the pipes will be delivered from the street. Another option is that uh, there will be a local plant room. And that local plant room, really, we recommend to look into hybrid energy center with the mix of technologies rather than jumping to heat pump only solution, which is quite often temptation uh, now, I would say. So why, you know, we embracing heat pumps, we're looking into, into having them now on the projects, I would say make perfect sense. We actually been promoting them for, for many years in combination with other technologies. And what we need from heat pumps to, to operate efficiently, we need low return temperatures. And then as well, they operate more efficiently with the lower flow temperatures. Again, you can see here that general statement from CPC that if we decrease the output temperature, so the flow which we deliver from heat pump for about 5K, for 5 degrees Kelvin, then we can increase efficiencies for about 10 to 20%. So it's really huge steps in efficiency of heat pump. This is not like a boiler, which we are used that it will operate pretty much with the same efficiency all year round. Heat pumps need very different treatment. So if we're talking about air source heat pump, obviously outdoor temperature will influence the efficiency. But another very important point is that operating temperature. So what you can see here that if we take the same reference point outside, five degrees Celsius, and then operate the same heat pump, either at 30 to 35, 40 to 45, or 60 to 65. So obviously that second temperature will be design flow temperature and constant delta T of 5 degrees across the heat pump. You can see the big change in efficiency. We're going from 3.63, and then this is decreased to even less than 2 COP if we push the same heat pump to operate at the higher temperature range. Obviously, we see that the difference in numbers, I would say, is a bit difficult to have a feel what it really means. That's what we put in this other part of the table, what it means in energy cost and carbon from operating that heat pump for one year. And that it becomes very clear that if we operate heat pump at lower temperatures, it will cost around 13,000 pounds a year. If we push the same heat pump for much higher temperatures to operate operation, you can see that the cost of operating that pump almost double. So huge change, and you can see again, carbon goes again, carbon footprint much, much higher if we operate at higher temperatures. That's why the drive for lowering the temperatures on the systems. When it comes to the integration in a plant room, obviously that is various options. We're always happy to discuss on a project by project basis. But one of them could be that you have heat pump here and then CHP and boiler included as well. Heat pump here always first on the return. Previous slide shows how the temperatures, how important they are for efficiency of heat pump. So low, the benefit of low return temperature is here taken care of if we have it first on the return, preheating. Here we suggest as well still CHP. The building regs, new building regs, which are coming in June this year, they very last minute uh, in SAP, I would say a few months ago, they changed the factors for uh, generated electricity on site and flexible CHP got quite good, uh, can still deliver good uh, CO2 reduction. So I think if we look on the cost of operation, that's something very important to still keep in mind. And then here for peak capacity, a boiler, which in this case could be a gas boiler. If there is no gas supply on site, then I strongly recommend having a heat pump and electric boiler for peak capacity, 
that from the point of view on the space required, uh, required and capex from the project is really uh, lots of benefits compared with heat pump on the solution. As you see here, a few points on that slide that on example project, we needed either six air source heat pumps or a combination of heat pump, CHP and then boiler. And you see capex, a huge difference between those two solutions. OPEX, again, a very big difference, although it was with prices a, a few months ago, but you see that with generation of electricity on site, we can have a much lower cost of heating that building and heat pump efficiency. Again, with heat pump on the solution, it means we will have a higher operating range temperatures for heat pumps, lower efficiency for heat pumps than on the hybrid system. One other slide showing that benefit of the, of the hybrid system, you see here all the what's called load duration curve. So you have all the hours in a year and how much of the demand is there for heating and hot water in a given, for a given number of hours. And obviously everything in a plant room needs to be sized for that peak capacity that needs to be there for that coldest day. But we have to keep in mind that that rarely occurs. That probably is only a couple of days every five or maybe even every 10 years. So that capacity needs to be there, but it's hardly for operation. So you can see that relatively small CHP and heat pumps, so about 40 kilowatts each, both green colors, but operating for long hours, they can deliver majority of demand. So in kilowatt hours, that could be easily 80, 85, even 90%. Then the boiler, much bigger capacity, 174 kilowatts, but sitting there and only helping for those events when we need uh, bigger demand because it's that you know beast from the east and we really need much more heating to be delivered. It can be topping, temp topping up on the flow temperature as well. But obviously that's a limited share, so it doesn't have that big uh, impact on the total CO2 emission calculation for the whole year for the building. Those are those factors for the new building regs coming in June, which I mentioned already. So for the CHP itself, we have several factors now. And if we consider new CHP, you can see that if there is a flexible operation, so in response to signal markets, so referring back to what I said before about the prices and storage and heat pump operating at the right time, you can see here as well, if it happens that on the grid, we don't have much of the wind power generation because just weather doesn't allow it, then it's better to switch on local CHP and still deliver not only lower carbon electricity, but definitely a lot lower cost electricity. So those factors are going to be in use from, from June this year, definitely until 2025 when the next overhaul of the building regs is expected. So now we're moving really to the last step, to the B scene. So really mentioning already before that we need to understand how buildings are operating to, to see a bit more, you know, to are we achieving what was the intent? I will hand over back to Jonathan and he will finish with those last few slides. Thank you. Um, I hope I have a small menu here to choose <laughs> which, which screen I want to share. Um, Okay, this should be the correct one. Great. Um, yes, thank you, Garza. Um, so what we've identified is that really we need tools to be able to see how we're getting on with net zero. Um, and what we're very conscious of is that about three quarters of UK councils have declared this climate emergency and more than half of, half of them have committed to net zero by 2030. Um, and that is, I think, we're all conscious, that's quite a steep challenge. Um, but yeah, how do you know when you reach net zero? If you don't know when you start, don't know where you are. Um, what we know from monitoring our CHPs is that information is power. We can look at this and we can go to those buildings and say, okay, um, we see a return temperature to the plant room is high, let's address that. And so, yeah, we identified this sort of need, um, and this is going to be very product focused, but um, we just bring to market a Danish product called Energy Raven. Um, and I'll give you a bit of the story first, um, which is in Norse mythology, um, Odin he had one eye, and I'm not entirely sure why, but he always had two ravens with him. Um, one was called Munin, and one was called Hugin. 
And their purpose was to go out every morning and collect information for him on how his kingdom was actually doing. Um, so Moonin brought back the memory, which is the data, and Hugin uh, brought back the thought, the understanding. Um, and so, yeah, so bringing out this sort of this software platform, um, which is for monitoring data, energy raven, but we have this benefit that um, we understand how buildings operate. So I just want to show you a couple of bits of this tool because I think, yeah, knowing where we are on our journey is going to be absolutely critical to success. Um, so in this tool, we're able to see what our consumption is for a building for a year in terms of heat, electricity, uh, gas, water, etc. And if we think about our steps to net zero, the first one being eliminating waste and um, looking at the sort of, oh, sorry, I can't see the, <laughs> I can't get my mouse onto the, oh, there we go. Um, if we're looking at eliminating waste, a graph like this shows us when we're using waste outside of, uh, energy outside of operational hours. Um, so we very quickly say, okay, we're turning the lights on and the heating on when no one's in the building. How do we change that? In addition, we're able to benchmark our building. So here we've got a list of Danish schools. And you can see very quickly, okay, uh, this one is performing really very badly, 184 kilowatt hours per meter squared. Uh, and it's, for me, it's nice to see the Danes aren't doing everything perfectly. Um, but we say, okay, we need to address this particular building. And then we can move on to the next low hanging fruit, etc. Sorry, I'm trying to change slides there. What we can also do is our ESG reporting. So this may not be quite as important for councils to actually do the ESG reporting, but this gives us a measure, um, certainly for businesses, of how we're, you know, how much CO2 we're emitting. Um, and this is all automated. So um, it's a very quick way to understand our journey to net zero. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm not going to go into any more detail other than to mention this is a cheap thing to do, but the typical energy savings um, average across all the buildings, the 16,000 meter points that energy data, energy raven has, is 17.3%, and that's year on year. Um, so it's, it's more here to say if, if you can monitor your buildings, the chance of success of achieving net zero is going to be increased by about 17% per year. Um, and just to round up then, we think you need to have a tool to be able to view exactly what's going on in your schools. You need to be maximizing your delta T and we're recommending around 60-30. Um, though if you can eliminate stored hot water, that might change a little bit. Um, and what we'd like to see is meeting the, what the Danes are doing, 41 kilowatt hours per meter squared in our schools, or they're aiming for at least, because you know, we have a warmer climate. Um, we have exactly the same tools as the Danes have, the same you know, VLUX window, rock core, insulation, etc. Um, why can't we get to where they are? I just want to mention here we've got lots of um, information on our website, sav-systems.com, where you can read more about all our different products. Um, also, we've touched very lightly on our products here. Um, We've got a lot more than we could say. So if you are interested in any other um, CPDs from us, we'd be very happy to deliver them. Um, we've got some on ventilation, on hybrid energy systems, design of space heating. Um, there should also be one soon on energy monitoring. Um, yeah, we'd love to present them to you. And thank you there for your attention. Um, I will stop sharing now. Thank you. Jonathan, there was one question from Ben, Collins, oh. which you said, I think, yeah, yep. it's very good and important question in regards to ventilation and technical annex from the Department of Education. Yes. Um, yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, so, yeah, the DFE seems to be recommending cross-flow ventilation. Um, cross-flow ventilation, uh, maybe let me start with the, with the last bit. How would an airmaster type unit deal with overheating? And primarily nighttime cooling is the answer. So cooling the thermal mass of the building in advance of use the next day. And um, so the strategy we have with our master units is should the room temperature exceed 26 degrees on any given day, the nighttime cooling will come on automatically overnight uh, for six hours. It will bring in air at 14 degrees and that will cool the room down in advance of occupancy, uh, cool the thermal mass down in advance of occupancy. 
And that has been shown to be by far one of the most effective um, methods of cooling buildings. And it's an ancient method of doing things. Um, it's been done for thousands of years. And that's typically what we do. And also um, with our masters, we have a control logic in there that says, instead of just doing purge ventilation, you know, purge ventilation involves bringing hot air into your building, which is not ideal. Um, if doing purge, we do do it, but if doing purge means that you're actually increasing the room temperature, just limit, we, we limit our airflow back to the demand controlled ventilation rate. Um, so if that's lower than 100%, then we're able to limit the amount of air going into that classroom instead of going for, for maximum flow rate at all times. Um, what I would also like to address here is that the, this idea that we will be in a permanent summer for, you know, by 2080, there will be summertime all year round. I mean, right now, about 78% of the school year is at external temperature below about 17 degrees. The, so the enormous, you know, even by 2080, if we have a two degree increase, we're going to have an enormous span of the school year by design during the heating season. So I'm, I really struggle to understand why the focus is on summertime and not on wintertime. And what we know is that ventilation, you know, taking, extracting air extracts heat. So I really can't get my head around the focus on the summer um, and why it's not on heat loss during the winter. I did see um, the presentation for the DFE and I think the response was that they weren't too concerned about the energy consumption. They may be more concerned about the carbon footprint, but um, I would argue that the carbon footprint of your heating plant to deal with the heat loss you incur by using natural ventilation was substantially higher than what your the heat, uh, sorry the carbon footprint of your ventilation would be. Um, and I did have a look on the case study that I mentioned earlier with the 64% reduction in energy consumption. There, the um, impact of the reduction in PV panels far, far, far outweighed. The, the carbon footprint of ventilation systems. Um, 500 meters squared of PV panels, despite reduction in carbon footprint of those, has a huge carbon footprint. I hope that answers your question. Um, that's one I get quite a lot, I'm afraid. <laughs> we are aware of that, we must say. Yeah, we, we, we are in, in discussions and communication with the Department of Education. And I, yeah, let's see what is with Tom Foolis. And we'd be avoiding gas at all costs due to its carbon value rather than encouraging hybrid system. So that's, I would say, quite a common wishful thinking that our grid electricity is so green. Uh, I, I'm a geek to, to some extent, but right now in the UK, 52% of our electricity comes from gas power stations. So unfortunately, for a long time still in the UK, a lot substantial amount of electricity is coming from gas power station. So just putting a heat pump in a building doesn't mean we're not using a, a gas on the system. And a gas power station in the UK, unfortunately, they dumping heat in atmosphere. They not combine heat and power, they don't capture heat. They generate electricity with about 50% efficiency and about half of energy input is going out in the atmosphere. So using a smaller CHP with 88, 90% efficiency is lower carbon than gas power station. But that's why it's recognized in the building regs that flexible operation. If we happen to have very sunny, very windy day, then I would say switch off local CHP. But like right now, 52% comes from the electricity comes from the gas power station, which are not efficient. It's better than to have efficient gas use in a, in a CHP, local CHP. So that's I, I personally still see hybrid including gas CHP. Another version, because that sometimes people are really against gas connection right now, then I would say elect, heat pump and electric boiler. Worth consideration rather than going for heat pump only. That's something, again, if you refer to CPC, CP1, you will see that combination is being recommended there for CAPEX, OPEX, uh, maybe less, but definitely CAPEX, that's that's a huge and space required. If we talk heat pumps, obviously we didn't touch those details here, but how much space you need, electrical connection to the, to the building and noise uh, levels and all these questions are come to be answered. So thank you very much. I think I, uh, we address all the questions in the mm -hmm. chat box. Yes, uh, I'd like to thank you, Beata and uh, Jonathan, for a very informative uh, webinar there. There's a lot of areas, again, 
there's not a, there's not a silver bullet that solves everything, but you've given some really good pointers areas to look at. Um, especially I hadn't thought about before with the going for the high delta T's, the heating systems. You need to be able to balance those systems properly to get them to work to work in the right way. And again, with a different type of um, uh, TRV head. So just one of the things that's on my side. But uh, again, I'd like to thank you for the presentation. Yeah, lots of information there. So that is fantastic. I'm mindful of time. We've run over a little bit on that, but I think there's some really good questions at the end that came through. Uh, and just to remind everybody, keep an eye out for the rest of the seminars we will we will uh, be presenting through Spaces. And to keep an eye out for uh, details, the study day on the 23rd of June at De Montfort University. Um, a reminder, there was another one there that the, there is a link there in the chat for the, um, if you do want your CPT certificates, but Fiona will be um, emailing those out uh, as well to everybody. So again, thank you all. I'll just look to Fiona to see if there's anything else I've forgotten or is that